complicated, you know, man. I got down old Rubik's Cube, man. You like talking about that blue red, man. Then you get to one side, they plug it, man. You mess it up. All right, Thomas, welcome back to the show. How you doing, man? I'm very well. Thanks for hosting me. Yeah, I'm glad to have you on. Obviously, you know, you're a recurring guest. You and I talk a lot, you know, off uh, off air. Indeed. And as you've no doubt, you know, become aware, I get ideas stuck in my head and it takes me a while to kind of figure out what I want to say on it. And this is sort of the result of a series of conversations you and I have had over probably the last like six to eight weeks about kind of the, the, the history of the right wing and, and a case for optimism. So let's start with first just the the broad outline of the right wing in America. And and before we went live, you said something really interesting, which I think is is pertinent and probably a good way to start here. And you said that essentially the conservative movement in America sort of got demolished by the Civil War. And from then to about FDR, it's it's all progressives. So do you want to maybe talk about the origins of the Republican Party and how that kind of became a right-wing movement? Yeah. I mean, to your point, any kind of organic right-wing in the deeply traditional sense was demolished by the war between the states. I mean, obviously, okay. But... In 20th century terms, the right did come back um, with America first. And America first wasn't just, you know, it wasn't it wasn't just a branding for Lindbergh, you know, and um, a coalition of people of, averse to intervention. It really was, and you Buchanan back when he wrote Worthwhile Copy, you know, he made the point that from the 1870s really until Wilson took the oath of office, you know, America was behaving a lot in, um, in power political terms, as well as in its economic model it was behaving a lot like the newly unified Germany and vice versa. Okay. Um, national economics, you know, basically anti-immigration, you know, to varying degrees. Um, the imperial executive is, you know, people, which, which has become a, a term of derision and, and like fear um, since, uh, you know, the Johnson era, but that was a real thing, you know, like, like sovereignty really did vest in the presidency, you know, and um, that, that's really what the, that, the post, post-war in the States that the American right was, okay? People forget, too, that, I mean, the, the, the Confederates were free traders. I mean, one of the, I don't want to go off on a tangent to sabotage the core discussion, but one of the things that kind of fatally doomed the the, the consensus as it, as it had existed since 1789 is that the kind of like new national economics was hyper-protectionist and that was strangling the South, okay? But, um admittedly it was like far less organic and and kind of deep deeply uh cultural in in terms of its constitution than uh you know kind of the southern tradition but the kind of new the, the kind of like new american right of america first i think it, it was a gen, it was a genuinely right wing movement at least in 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 20th century terms you know that was it wasn't like a contrivance but you know like like i'm always saying and like i said before we went live it's remarkable that Robert Taft is featured in Kennedy's profiles and courage. It's literally a eulogy of the American right saying like they fought a good fight, but you know, they're done now and that's no longer acceptable, nor respectable, nor can it ever come back. But that was, um, and then who did I, Eisenhower doesn't count as like a right or left figure. Cause he's like, neither like he, he was the consummate like managerial dictator and literally like the equivalent of a five-star general. Okay, but so after that, like, what what did what did the Republicans do? They fucking uh, they nominated Goldwater. I mean, who, who was who was this like weirdo gadfly? You know, I mean, he he do he give stump speeches on how we need to like abolish the IRS. And I mean, I'm not I'm not even I'm not saying that's like a not a correct sentiment, but I mean that's it was it was bizarre, you know. Um, but then 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 the right decided that it was 
or I mean, circumstances decided for it that it was it was just like the Cold War hawk party, you know, um, much much of the lament of people like George Kennan, you know, who was like at heart, I believe, like an old right kind of person. But, you well, know, and, I, and one of the things that, you know, and, and I've been, you know, compiling your talks with Pete into the, you know, the written form. Right. Which has actually been really helpful because it means that I've been going through your World War Two series literally line by line. No, I really, really a, appreciate that too. And for the listeners, that um, I, I can't thank you enough. And anybody who enjoys those transcriptions, um, we owe Jay Burden for that because he's the one who did it. Oh yeah, no, yeah, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. That's not why I brought it up. But you have this this line, and I think it's the first or the second episode, where where you talk about this this hang up in the Anglo mind about what is the definition of the right and the left. And it's this sort of idea that the only difference between the right and left is economic. That is the core difference. And, you know, you say that, that that's owed to, to Keynes, which I think is, is accurate. But I think it's also because, you know, if you look at the, the kind of genesis of, you know, the, the conservative movement, and obviously the neocons are their own different thing. That's a, that's a separate interest group. But it very much is in reaction to... FDR basically acting as an American dictator, you know, things like the NRA, not that NRA, the other one for anyone at home. Uh, and so it did sort of frame things in economic terms and the cultural stuff took, you know, sort of 30 years to metastasize, if that makes sense. No, that's a big part of it. And it's also, I emphasize, and I think people think I'm just resorting to hyperbole and I'm not, at least not intentionally. When I say that, you know, the the, the 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 New Deal revolution was 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 a revolutionary paradigm. It totally changed everything, you know, and it was a mass social engineering program, a lot of which was dismantled, but a lot of which endured. And speaking of Eisenhower, you know, from during Eisenhower's administration, the defense budget reached 50 percent of GDP. That's totally insane. That's Soviet. You know, and um, that, you know, the, the, the true military industrial complex, um, the, the social engineering of, I mean, we framed it as integration and eradicating racism. That, that, was, that, that, was, the, that was the New Deal sol solution to the, what Stalin called the nationalities problem. And that endured for decades. And basically it, it ended for all practical purposes in the Ford administration, at least in the terms that had been devised and implemented in decades previous, because this was like no longer viable, you know, it, uh, it, 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 and any, to, to see that through even to success in the eyes of the regime in terms of it accomplishing its goals would have been like a Pyrrhic victory. But, um, this, like this, this whole, like people don't realize how crazy it is. Um, and what, what a paradigm shift it was in 1933, that like very suddenly this whole like social engineering regime is just like imposed that did not exist before reconstruction. There was echoes of reconstruction in it, but I mean, even that, like, I mean, reconstruction really um, was, was a power political flex of an occupied um, of an occupied nation is the way to look at it. You know, this idea of we're going to literally devise the economy around social welfare and projecting military power globally. And we're gonna try and like eradicate people's like cultural identities by forcing them to integrate and make it a crime to not send your kid to a government school. Like this, this is insane. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's it, compared to what, what, what was then, you know, like normative in terms of, you know, American life and what, what was viewed as, you know, the, 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 the appropriate purview of government and what constituted private spaces discreet from public venues. You know, like this, this was this was incredibly extreme and revolutionary, as much as um as, as much as the Third Reich was, and uh as much as in sociological terms, absent the megacidal um excesses as, as the Soviet Union was, you know, and that can't like again, that can't be denied. You know, it's not it's not hyperbole or or some kind of like metaphor, you know. Um, so that that's something that I think people know. Well, and that's that's that brings up an interesting point because you know I was recently an outside appearance on on the Two Bit podcast, and and 
the other Jake great guys. was was talking to me and he basically asked me the question he's like well why do why does the regime hate us hate people like us and obviously i think some of that is just you know naked ethnic animosity right not gonna not gonna beat around the bush there but i think the other part is essentially the the social <clears throat> engineering didn't work you know and so if you look at a term like unreconstructed for a long period that's a slur right that effectively means you know this you're this kind of like backwoods hick and i think that when you look at you know certain parts of the american regime you know, there is a straight line from, you know, Reconstruction, Nuremberg, the civil rights era, quote unquote, and then, you know, certain aspects of what we see now. And it's that same desire to essentially engineer certain, you know, human behaviors and groupings out of existence. You know, it, it is, do, do you see what I'm getting at there? That kind of through line? At base, at, at base here's what it is, okay? There's a couple things here. I mean, first of all, I mean, the the, the regime as it exists today is is, is like an it's 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 anachronistic, in in all kinds of ways. You know, from the fact that it's it's structured in in kind of concrete policy terms, it's configured to fight the Cold War, and that's why it's constantly in search of like a raison d'etre, whether it's COVID or whether it's you know. Uh, or whether it's, you know, abolishing racism or whether it's pretending that there's domestic terrorists, be them, you know, like right wingers or Islamists among us, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a solution uh, in constantly in, in search of a, a problem since putting itself out of business on November 9th, 1989. But like more, the capital and the, the capital L liberal enterprise, based the Enlightenment enterprise. I mean, yes, there's many like intervening causes between then and now, as well as the dialectical processes that altered, you know, the kind of intellectual conceptual horizon of uh, of radicals. But the whole the whole kind of like modernist um, project is to annihilate man's ability to bear culture and to live historically. And to essentially turn him into some kind of inmate or some sort of economic integer or some kind of malleable social organism that is uh, most suited to governance at scale, which is totally perverted. And is, is, is even like both, I mean, there's, there's intentionally punitive features to that, obviously, but there's also, it's just, it's just, it's just axiomatically anti human. You know, so I mean, there's that. So basically, you know, if you're truly right wing or if you're truly like a thoughtful person who's got an interest in living historically, like whatever your race is, you know, the, you should realize that this presents an existential threat to yourself and everybody within your, you know, kind of ethnocultural and, and sociological orbit. Um, on top of that, because the regime so much owes its kind of mythologies and founding principles and aesthetics and narratives and moral claim to authority, because so much of it originates with, with the New Dealer revolution, it's fixated on kind of like anti-fascist political theology. So it's always going to identify fascists or whatever it views as like their contemporary iteration as a kind of demonic force or some kind of, you know, or some kind of public enemy, number one, in all times and places. Um, even though it doesn't make sense to talk about fascists anymore because, you know, it's not like fascist governments. Like in structural terms, every government is on this planet, with the exception of weird outliers like Saudi Arabia or like North Korea, you know, that for reasons of geopolitics or because of cultural backwardness, you know, like maintain like anachronistic institutions, at least, you know, superficially, like with the exception of things like that, like every every regime is like structured the same way, like its political values are different. You know, its relationship to the majority is different. Um, but, you know, it's like the Russian Federation is not like radically it's not structured radically differently. You know, than like the Buddhist Republic or like the United Kingdom or the United States. You know, so it doesn't make sense to talk about fascists anymore. But the regime can't, it can't, 
it can't eschew that kind of language because it's in itself is an anachronism, you know. So like it doesn't it, it doesn't know how to proceed, you know, either constructively in terms of accomplishing its own objectives or contra what it identifies as its existential enemies because it doesn't because it doesn't have a place in the 21st century in any like real sense. It's it's where the Soviet Union was in 1989. Like, let me qualify that. There's not going to be some sort of like November 9th moment here. You know, it, the, the American government, as it, as it exists now, it's going to endure probably for another 200 years in like some kind of like shambling, deteriorated sense. But it's it's an anachronism, and everybody on the planet realizes that who's at all thoughtful about politics. I realized I was long winded. No, no. So I'm curious because this is always something that I kind of go back and forth on. You know, there's this strain of, political realism, and I consider myself a political realist as, as most serious people do, that basically says, you know, all ideology is sort of downstream of just pure decisionism. You know, it's sort of a post hoc justification. So do you view that as currently the case that this kind of anti-fascism is just a, like explaining why, you know, our elites are in charge, or do you view it in a different light? It's a rationalization, but it's also, it's more deeply insinuated. Like I'm always saying, and uh, like an Austrian painter said, the United States is a lot more like the Soviet Union was than it's like anything else. Like the, the post-1933 United States. And it doesn't, it, it can't really rationalize its, either its, um, its ethical orientation or it's or, or or it's policy configuration or it's structure like absent this idea that you know there's some sort of uh you know there, there's some sort of global conflict underway that's both dialectical as well as concrete and 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 and, and military and power political you know whereby there's democracies and then not democracies like obviously that doesn't make any sense but absent that mythology and that kind of fake um configure alleged configuration of political reality like the united states government makes no sense you know so it's more invested in it than just as a rationale um that's uh and that's also one of the reasons why it's the like i mean like the soviet union it's a gerontocracy which never used to be the case in america you have like other problems, but speaking of Eisenhower, you know, Eisenhower's era, like if you were in your 50s, people would say you were like too old to be the president. You know, like, I mean, it, it's this idea of like 80 year old people who it's literally impossible to like eject them from office and they don't even like cycle or they don't even cycle within their own uh, kind of managerial cadre. Like that's really, that that's a peculiar kind of dysfunction, but it's also among other things, like if the regime replaced Nancy Pelosi with like some 45 year old like Mexican guy who actually like knew what the fuck he was doing, even if like he was, you know, some kind of committed like social welfare type, like he wouldn't he, he wouldn't maintain this fiction that, oh, we're fighting against the not democracy people and fascists. And, you know, we need we need to force integration and we need to, you know, we need, we need to honor the dignity of people with sex paraphilias because, you know, everybody knows that, you know, the only the only you know, the the only true central focus of human life is like sexuality and satisfying appetites. Like nobody believes in that anymore. Like nobody believes in that. Other than like 80 year old, uh, you know, career swamp creatures, you know, who went to Berkeley in the seventies and, and think that fucking garbage is true. You well, know, and, just, yeah. And I think that your comparison to the late Soviet union is, is particularly apt you know, one of the things that I thought was was interesting, you know, in kind of the last couple months has been, you know, the death of the death of Kissinger, you know, because again, like people kind of burn him in effigy for reasons that I think are kind of dumb. Well, they don't even know why. You're just like, they, well, again, that's what I'm saying. That's another holdover of that, you know, 1970s Berkeley. But my point is, my point is, I'm saying that is that the, the, the other thing I want to talk about is, is sort of the, the case for optimism. And one of the things that I, I can't help but kind of smile at is how, like, just the absolute inability of our regime to create competent people or to employ competent people. Because look, like, say what you will about Kissinger. 
anything people say about him could be true, but he was still a competent statesman. Like you have to give him that. And the fact that he's been replaced with, you know, the, the kind of people running the Russia Ukraine war, you know, just like shrilly wringing their hands, like, you know, like Pentecostalist, Pentecostalist, yeah, Pentecostalist, excuse me, you know, old women or something. It's just a sign of that, I think. What's well, also, I mean, these people literally have no, I mean, aside from the fact that, I mean, they're, 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 a lot of them are just like evil people. I mean, quite literally, they're like enemies of God, but they, they these people are like, they're, 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 they're mentally retarded. They have no concept of power political affairs. You know, like none of them speak like a foreign language. They, they have no understanding of military matters. They have no understanding of, of, uh, of power politics, like none, you know, they're, they're illiterate conceptually, but it's, I mean, who would, who would want to pursue a career in government after the cold war? I mean, it's, it's a play like only like sociopaths and losers and like, you know, people, the kinds of people who, who who wash them in Hollywood thinking that they deserve to be famous. That's literally the kind of people who, who gravitate to Washington since 1989. Like why, why would anybody want to, why why would anybody want to involve themselves in that? You know, like you, it's, it's not, it's, um, a a uh, a sensible regime, a rational regime, you know, a, a, an Aristotelian regime, and in, in the sense one can derive from the politics and the Nicomachean ethics, like what a what a basically dismantle itself after the Cold War, like assuming that you know, I mean, the Cold War is a real thing, like regardless, I mean, then there was a bound of rationality to waging it. Whether I'm mean, not going to argue whether that was like good or bad. In like dialectical historical terms as well as in concrete terms but the point is there's a reason why like the best and the brightest you know whether you're talking about men who could devise design build um orbital bombardment platforms you know to 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 deploy nuclear weapons with no early warning or whether guys who you know like kissinger who had just like an intrinsic understanding of of power political occurrences and kind of div- divinate what was going to happen before it did before like indicators were really emergent. Like, I mean, that's the reason why those guys gravitated to government, you know, like now it's again, it's, it's a repository of like losers, wannabes, you know, freaks who, 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 who crave clout, you know, like an addict craves drugs. I mean, these, these are, these are about the most like mediocre, kind of degenerate people you can imagine you know i mean that's that's why um, well and i think that that that's interesting you you bring up the concept of of craving clout because i think that one of the things that has been interesting to watch you know because i'm a i'm a young guy so you know as much as i remember the bush era you know i sort of came came of my own you know under obama and i remember this this changeover and it's when Democratic activists on Twitter basically became a core part of the Democratic constituency. Like it was important to appease those people. And so, you know, the the state would undertake actions that were manifestly stupid, basically to have kind of a highlight reel, you know, to put on social media, to say certain things. You know, I, I think of, and you see this very much in kind of the rhetoric towards conservatives. You know, that even people like the, you know, Obama's famous remarks about bitter hangers on, you know, this is very much in the line of, you know, the basket of deplorables thing. But even, you know, to, to keep going back to the Russian Ukraine conflict, right, this this ill conceived spring slash summer slash winter offensive, right, where effectively they were just like, well, we need to do something. So march into the line, you know, and just got absolutely mulched largely so they could you know, do what they did, which is basically make a Marvel movie hype trailer for an upcoming, (laughs) an upcoming, uh, you know, military uh, action, which is just beyond retarded. It's like Michael Scheuer said, I mean, sometimes really jarring, you know, because I grew up, I mean, like everybody, every Gen Xer did, you know, I grew up being afraid of nuclear war. And, um, you know, my first, my first understanding of what kind of political life was President Reagan. And um, and I'm not some huge Reaganite or something, but um, Reagan arguably had the most competent uh, foreign policy cabinet that's like in the modern era. Okay, 
And uh, Bush, uh, the Bush Baker kind of regime, you know, I've been discussing that with our guy Pete Canones. That was a, a continuation of that same tendency. The the kind of shoehorning of Bill Clinton, this like literal clown, like into the presidency, it, it was fucking jarring. It was like really, really weird. And like Michael Scheuer, he's kind of um, Scheuer's kind of a, a flake and kind of a hype. But um, I do agree with him on some on on some core subjects like policy related. You know, and he said that you know he was a uh, he was in charge of the of uh, the Bin Laden desk at CIA, and I mean, I on the first admit CIA has been a joke really since uh, since the Gates hearings in the seventies. But they did have some intelligent people, particularly you know um, in the later Cold War, and particularly like the regional studies people. Okay, Shorey was one of them. Shorey talks about how he briefed Clinton in Albright, and this kind of the whole sort of like. Uh, the whole sort of like clown car of these fucking fools about bin Laden. If he was as coal and Clinton said, literally like this guy just lives in a cave. Can't we just get some ninjas to go kill him or something? And then he said, Clinton just like lost interest and put an end to like the, the, the meeting, you know, just like no interest, no understanding uh, of anything. You know, like, it's just, it's like a video game to him or just like Osama bin Laden only existed as, as, as some kind of factor that can impact like PR for the day. They're like, that's it. You know, um, I mean, the point of people, like when, when DeSantis or like when fucking that hook, that fucking Punjabi hooker trick baby, Tricky Faley, like these people really are like, they're, they're like staggeringly fucking stupid. Like they're not like dumbing down their language to like relate to the common man. Like they, they, they're fucking idiots. You know, they have like no understanding of foreign cultures. They've got no understanding of war and peace. They got no understanding of military affairs and like what's realizable through military means. So to them, the Ukraine war doesn't really exist. It's just like some kind of, yeah, it's, it's just kind of like some, it's just kind of, it's just some sort of like PR quantity and you just like keep it going as long as possible. And then eventually it just, you know, it'll fade from the news cycle because people get tired of it. That's like where it starts and ends with them. It's not real, you know, and that's, you can't, you can't project power globally. Like if that's the way, your control group views the planet and the way it views like life and death matters. Like you just can't do it. You know, um, that's why I always maintain like America is not a real superpower and people always like jump my shit and say, I'm like some bitter old man. It's like, well, okay. I mean, I, I think I know something thinking a kiss and actually did meet the guy. I mean, I do, I'm not, I'm not saying that for clout. What I'm saying is that I'm not just like some jago up, like lipping off about stuff. I do actually have some insight into these things. And when I say this isn't sustainable, it's not out of like bitterness or whatever. It's, I mean, that that's a cold art fact, but, um, that was a bit of a rant. Forgive me. So I think that you're, I think that you're, you're spot on there. But the other thing that I, I wanted to get into is sort of the, the, the case for optimism. And obviously, you know, you've been in this thing for quite a while. And I, I think that, you know, I want to give my case for optimism first, then I'll turn it over to you. Because, you know, as I've said before on this show, I'm an avowed elitist. You know, I, I don't believe that we work like, you know, the Church of Latter-day Saints. We don't go door to door for this kind of thing. We're, we're fundamentally vanguardists. And so from that perspective, right, like I don't need 50 plus one percent of the population to make this work. I mean, we need good people. And I look at this in kind of a, you know, a balanced equation where it's, it's sort of this zero sum game where they are getting worse you know, they are very manifestly getting worse at this. And I look at our thing and there are more and more guys who are competent, capable guys who are unable to index with the system. They are not wanted, need not apply. And so from that perspective, it's, it's never been easier to kind of sell this thing, right? So that's a huge one. Well, and then also, right, like just look at the, you know, the relative ground gained. Like, obviously, you know, I, like I said, I remember the, the GWAT era. I understand the type of forces that can be kind of brought to bear to, you know, bring people kind of back within the fold. But like, let's not, you know, sugarcoat the fact that roughly half of the U.S. voting population views the regime as to one degree or another illegitimate, which uh, I consider 
a positive sign to put it mildly back to you thomas well yeah it's unprecedented and i yeah the fact of the matter is i mean the fact that you and i have become friends and comrades and there's this entire literally like a community of thousands of people that we've connected with you know that i mean we we, we quite literally you know built alternative um an, an entire like alternative sociology okay and that's been facilitated by technology which is always a double-edged sword but you know i make that point to people again and again the degree to which people like us were truly alienated 30 years ago you know like i said i don't i, I don't want people to think i, I don't want to, it, i don't want i don't want friends of ours to feel like i'm attacking them or something but that's why the other day like on social media when people were insisting to me that the culture is so much worse than 30 years ago and like things are in the shitter that's completely off man like so much so you know 30 years ago i mean we we were like in hell man and the um there was no there, there was there was no path out of that and uh it was very very difficult to make a living unless you were truly insinuated into regime adjacent structures and that's not the case at all anymore and it's also i mean nobody who the hell who the hell identifies with the system man like other than truly broken people or I'm not talking about like redditors who like claim that you know they're they're part of some subculture of cartoon characters or of you know who who or who identify as having no gender but they like to pee on people or something. Like I'm talking about in actual concrete terms, like who's gonna like live and die by the purported values of this regime? Like nobody. Okay. Um it doesn't, there's no percentage in it. And to your point, also, we don't care what you know, the hoi polloi are doing, you know, they're, they're at worst, like an obstacle to things. They're at best, you know, kind of like a speed bump or something. I mean, I don't, I don't, I know people think like, Oh, what's so great about you? Like nothing. I'm not saying I'm like smarter, or, like better than anybody. And I mean, every, every man and woman is like de equally depraved and sin, but um, you know, the, there's, there's never going to be some like raw majority of people we're kind of like on the cusp of, of of the zeitgeist and who you know lead the way in terms of in, in terms of restructuring you know a, a broken sociology um the owing, owing to you know owing, owing to political developments um of the past you know um so yeah i honestly i, I don't i don't deal in utopias or counterfactuals but in absolute terms, I, I don't really see how we could be doing better than we are. I mean, I I continue to be amazed at, you know, the victories we log in, in cultural terms, and conceptual terms. You know, like I said, I'm not trying to be a cop, but like I said to Keith Woods, when he was nice enough to, you know, invite me to drop audio with him in Nashville, I, I assumed all this would be happening, like, after I was dead. You know, I planned to be here for a minute, but I knew that systemically there was going to be a, a failure because again like just the center cannot hold any more than the soviet union's um ideological culture could hold but i figured it would probably be you know like it, you know towards the end of the century you know the fact that um it's developed this sort of cultural momentum in earnest um and so rapidly is uh very inspiring and causes me optimism it's interesting you bring up that that concept of you know being willing to kind of kill and die for this regime you know because there seemed to over the past couple of weeks to have been some kind of like secret squirrel nudge unit stuff going on in the uk which their yeah. government is want to do and they basically they floated this and they floated this concept where you know supposedly such and such admiral says you know if we fight a generalized land war against russia which is a you know, stupid premise in the first place, we would have to reinstitute the draft. And so what that basically allowed them to do, right, was sort of run that as a test case. Like this was obviously a hypothetical. It, of course, hits media. A and from that came several interesting points of data, which is one, uh, to, to put it bluntly, new arrivals don't want to fight. You know, people who are not kind of committed to home and hearth. But even more so than that, you know, while it's certainly better 
you know, the legacy Brits are not up for this either, are not willing to kind of give anything up. And don't get me wrong that, you know, the, the draft is never particularly popular, but, you know, given the, the kind of historic problems the entire West is having with recruiting, I mean, I think that that's kind of an indicator that the there is not a moral u- unity between, you know, the ruler and the ruled here. You know, the, the, the mandate of heaven is sort of up for grabs, it seems. No, 100%. And that's the whole... I mean, that's why it doesn't... Um, what's, what's, again, I mean, kind of the distilled essence of the Enlightenment enterprise. When I say distilled essence, I mean, without some of the dialectical um, intervening tendencies you know, uh, particularly like of a Hegelian sort and a, and a Marxist sort. If you read John Rawls, who really for like, like, like really from, from the 1970s, probably until like around like the millennium, he was kind of like held out as, as like the court kind of like political sociologist in, at any like university. And his kind of magnum opus is called a theory of justice, you know, and um. He he literally devises the most pointless society you can imagine. You know, I mean, like they don't. I, I mean, obviously, like it's perverse to aim to kind of devise the kind of sociological order that that these people envision as being, you know, desirable or even utopian. But even within the bound rationality of their goals, it's like, why on earth would anybody feel any affinity for that? Like for like this regime whose objective is to like eradicate culture so that everybody can be like made into a tabula rasa where there's no conflict. I mean, it's basically the ideology of like a, of like a nursing home or, or like a mental hospital or something. Well, you, you, you know see I mean? that in, in Bentham as well, right? With his oh, concept yeah. of no. the Panopticon where it's effectively no, yeah, ben, just Bentham, like Wally. Bentham. Yeah, Bentham's uh, ben- Bentham's utopia is, a, is like a nightmare. You know, it's like what, like why, why on earth would anybody like find any, like like how would this like stir anybody to anything? You know, I mean, it's like uh, it, it's it's just kind of like a, it, it's kind of like a suicide by apathy ideology. You know, I mean, and that's like what's, it's it, you know, and that's like what's remarkable about it. Um, there's like a bona fide like senility there. You know, well, and I um, think that for, forgive me if it is too far afield, but I, I was talking with my wife about this. Where you know, there's a degree to which modernity sort of you know desexes men and desexes women, right? That it it both you know we are robbed of of purpose on a societal level, but also you know on kind of the male and female level. You know that you and I have talked before that sort of the the male rite of passage is battle and the female is childbirth. You know and. Uh, obviously our, our regime is, is uh, interested in disincentivizing both of those things, either directly or indirectly. And so, you know, it's interesting that our enemies are these kind of like androgynous freaks because they really are the men that the regime wants them to be. You know, they have, they have, they have embodied their values and you sort of see that in these kind of like horribly depressed you know, shapeless, sexless, kind of like blobs of, of like human detritus, I guess, if I'm not being too verbose. No, 100%. And that's not, you know, yeah, I mean, that's why, that, that's the point of ways of, I mean, I've been, emphasizing, I've been emphasizing this point to people for decades, you know, that's, you know, that's not, that's not even a slave revolt. I mean, a slave revolt is animated, it, it, it's, it's animated by uh, a, a compelling mythology, like that's that's why it's dangerous. I mean that's that's why that's why that's why Marxist Leninism was dangerous. You know, that's why that's why it was able to accomplish megacidal um destruction at scale. You know, like creating yeah, creating 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 like Bentham's uh like like global prison inmate. I mean, like what do you what what it, what potential exactly do these people have? I mean if that, that those are your standard bearers for regime values, like what do you like what like what 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 potentiality is there you know i mean that um that's why like i said too like these it sounds callous and people tell me i'm like a bad christian i mean whatever but like i it's like these people like 
essentially committing suicide, you know, like not reproducing and, um, you know, just kind of like living, living the lives of animals with the power of speech. I, 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 good. I, I want them to take themselves out of history. You know, I mean, anybody who's frankly, anybody who's susceptible to that kind of social conditioning these days, but there's so many avenues to counteract that sort of, um, that sort of, uh, propaganda and socialization. I mean, there's no excuse for it. I mean, anybody who just lays down and, and, and becomes, uh, you know, um, becomes for practical purposes, you know, an, an empty vessel driven by appetite. I mean, they're not, um, they've embraced like subhumanity, like what these people are not our friends. Well, and that goes back to the, into the sort of, natural elitism you have to have here because you know much is made of how gay my generation is both in a pejorative and in a literal sense right and recently there was one of these kind of pop psychology studies which i realized they're complete garbage but it, it sort of serves my point here that said you know roughly 35 percent of people in my age group self-identify as you know being a sexual minority and, and to me that sort of says one thing, right? Because we kind of know the data on homosexuality. You know, it's a certain percentage between roughly two and five percent of men, much lower for women. But you know, the point stands. That's sort of a, a fact of human existence. Now, how do you go in three generations from let's just round up and say five to thirty-five if it is born this way? It's obviously not. What it is is it's a social contagion. And what that shows is that that's effectively 30 some percent of the population that will literally go along with whatever power says. Right. Yeah. And yeah. that's just how people work. And in most cases, you know, when you're not kind of helmed by these kind of like anti-human, you know, Satanist freaks that kind of serves you well, you know, that's sort of good genetic programming. But to me, you know, that there's sort of a, a case for optimism in that, right. That effectively, like, it doesn't really matter. You know, if you give those people five years of social conditioning, you know, they'd be marching around with armbands and, and, you know, talking about their favorite Austrian painter, right? Well, that's why, I mean, that's why, like, people, like I said, again, and it's even, I mean, I don't, as I age and, like, as, like, I guess, uh, I, I guess, like, my willingness to filter my own um, discourse has sort of lessened, you know, I, I find more and more, like, people who supposedly are adjacent to us, like calling me an asshole, whether it's cause like you think I'm supposed to hate Muslims or the big thing is they're constantly telling me that like you're an asshole because you defend slavery all the time. Like natural slavery is a thing. I, I, I don't, I think slave owning societies are dysfunctional in, in certain ways. I don't want to like reinstitute chattel slavery because that's its own. First of all, importing racial aliens for that purpose is, is, is a whole ball of dysfunction. But, um, the whole people misunderstand what I'm saying. It's, you know, the more I age, the more I realize Aristotle essentially was right about everything in, in in political and sociological capacities. You know, slavery didn't emerge because like a bunch of guys got together and they're like, hey, let's just like brutalize, like arbit let's arbitrarily brutalize some coterie of people and convince them that they're slaves. That's not how things work. You know, like and as you age, you realize that there really are populations. And this goes across racial lines. I mean, yeah, th there's, there's there's a greater representation of this type in some racial groups than others, but there, there there's a tremendous number of men who simply are looking for somebody to be their master. Like they need that, and that's their default setting, and they don't know what to do with themselves without it. You know, and in, no matter what you do, you're not going to turn that man into like a master in his own right. Like that's not possible. You know, and that's one of the, you know, that that's one of the, you're not really right wing until you can come to terms with that. And I, I agree basically, like, like I think John Bowden made that point, like in a discussion he gave on Evola. Julius Evola, I've got mixed feelings about, but the stuff that there are key concepts that Evola emphasized again and again, particularly as a sociology that are fundamentally important. And the issue of natural slavery is one of those things. You know, and people, they come at me like, would, would you want to be a slave? That's not, you're not understanding what I'm saying. I'm talking about the basic nature of a tremendous number of people on this planet. You know, and you, you need to pretend that 
they're not what they are or you know you can realize that okay well you've, you've annihilated the institutions that basically allowed them to integrate morally and sociologically and conceptually in a, into like the broader paradigm and because you don't know because you don't know what to replace that with you just like lock them in jail i mean that's essentially like what what liberalism is well and that's a point that you know thomas carlyle makes i can't remember where i've read enough of him that i can't exactly sort it or cite it but when he talks about prison he makes that point yeah you know he basically you know d describes a, a certain caliber of person who you know unless like can literally not handle freedom it, it reminds me very much of that that book cannibals all by fitzhugh i think he's a you know, he's a virginian and, and bagby cites him cited him in a discussion yeah. he and I had about slavery, but he makes a very similar point. And, you know, I think that, you know, it's interesting you bring up that kind of classical retort of like, well, would you, would you like to be a slave? And it's like, well, okay, we're, we're sort of talking, if you assume that that's a good faith argument, which I think is a big if, right? You're sort of talking past each other, you know, because it's this assumption that it's this assumption that, you know, slavery in and of itself just kind of makes you a certain way instead of vice versa if you get what i'm saying no and it's also i mean honestly like what's truly unethical in in kind of universal terms and there are universal ethics not in the way that capital L liberals claim um obviously or um but uh but what, what know, christians very... refer to is is common grace essentially yeah, and practical reason, you know, uh, in um, in uh, in Platonic terms, but um, you know, demanding that people be things they can't be. I mean, that's a lot. And then if they can't, locking them in prison. I mean, that's I find that to be unconscionably cruel. And uh, as well as I mean, that breeds all kinds of like social pathologies, just in, in like immediate terms. But I mean, how? How, how can people rationalize that and then say that, you know, I'm some like morally depraved brute or something because I maintain that slavery is as natural as any other kind of like in any kind of like, you know, human office or behavior paradigm? Well, and this is this is not to turn this into just like making fun of progressives, but I'll be honest, it's kind of funny. You know, you see this 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 quite often. You know, this kind of glib line that, like, oh, like, you know, homosexuality is found in over two thousand species or something, which is completely spurious. But it's this idea, and it's only deployed tactically that you know what is natural is good. You know, that essentially, like, what I want, you know, if other organisms and I am merely an organism is kind of a, a buried premise in that, then it's fine. You know, but obviously, when you take it to it, sort of, you know, maybe like Nietzsche and logical end point you know they're completely horrified by it you know just uh, sort of an off topic aside That's also, I mean, even even in more and more like and more kind of like prosaic and more just kind of like crude biological terms like cannibalism is like natural i mean like, you know it's like okay i uh yeah i mean what is that what's also they don't, they don't realize how strange it is to be um they don't realize how strange it is the for for like for sex to be just like at this you know, like existentially central. That's really, really, really weird. Like moral, uh, like moral considerations aside. You know, I mean, it's like, like they don't. This really, and again, I mean, maybe it's as I age, these things appear like more and more strange. You know, like I, is, is, I mean, so light life is. If I accept this kind of paradigm about like the inherent dignity of the person, you know, and that, uh, you know, natural human impulses of appetite, you know, making up kind of like the core of the, of the, of the, of the constitution of the person. It's like, so, so life is like a, it, it's like an orgasm contest or, you know, you like, like what, what does that even equate to, you know, like it's, uh, it's, it's like, it's like organizing your life around like eating or going to the bathroom. Well, you know and, I mean? and that's like actually a, a point that, you know, that, that Lewis made, you know, and Lewis has sort of this bad reputation as being kind of like a little bit like wet or a little bit kind of uh, mild. But he has some some serious no, I, insight. I, I'm a huge fan of his science fiction stuff. I, I am too. That would actually this is this is off topic and not very good podcasting. But it might be fun to do if you're up for it because we've done a, a, a couple conversations on sci-fi to do a 
maybe a review on one of the Lewis's sci-fi books. Because no, especially that, that second and third one are great. The third like, is I, fantastic. And especially oh, I know. like him drawing upon Merlin as like a real person and like his, his, his concept that, you know, like in the deep lore of cultures, you know, archetypes who might may have been like historical personages or may not have been like become real. Like I'm fascinated by that. But uh, yeah, I'll, I talk about C.S. Lewis, because I never got into Tolka, and I was like a science fiction guy. I heard Frank Herbert. And like, I'm, I'm Anglo as fuck, you know, like in the, for all practical purposes. But like, I never, I was never like huge. I was never like a huge like Anglophile in terms of like my reading habits. Mm-hmm. But C.S. Lewis is fucking dope, man. Him and Somerset Mom. Um, but yeah, we, we should definitely do a dedicated like C.S. Lewis, specifically like, um, like, like science fiction is like out of the silent planet like series um, well and and the reason I, I bring him up is to is to kind of dovetail with something you said because he has this this line you know when dealing with you know people who who basically view life as kind of like a, a one orgasm contest where he's like well like what would you say to someone who believed like the defining you know characteristic of a good life was how many squares of chocolate you eat his point yeah. was like it's a completely like pointless like way to live, you know, like it's, it's yeah. certainly something that can be like individually pleasurable, you know, but to kind of turn your life to that end, I mean, well, it's, it, also it's clearly even limited, even like limited guys, like even, even guys who are like kind of limited in intellect and ability to, you know, kind of participate in, 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 in complex, like conceptual structures and things like, like the whole, you know, like they're, they're still fundamentally different from beasts. You know, this idea of, you know, th- this idea that you know the kind of natural human state is the pursuit of you know glandular appetite. That's just like not the way humans are. Aside from like everything else that's fucked up about that, you know, it's um, it's just not. You know, it's uh, that's the kind of uh, or I mean, there's people who might like resort to that kind of i mean that's that's i can't remember i think it was um christopher lash who late in life had kind of a a, a, a saw on the road to damascus conversion but he he made the point that um oh jesus i lost my fucking train of thought um so he made the point that you know essentially we're talking about uh you know life being this kind of like bestial pursuit of like i think glandular appetite yeah he made uh like he, uh, yeah, he made, he, made, he, made the point, he made the point that moderns behave like people who are in prison. You know, they, they develop these like weird <laughs> sexual paraphilias, you know, like these, uh, like substance abuse and like obesity becomes a huge problem, you know, because like this is basically what he was saying was that he was writing this like in the very early 90s. He's basically saying that like what's held out is like sociologically and, 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 and kind of like ontologically normal is the way people behave like under conditions of deprivation and like extreme like psychic stress and uh that's alarming and he was right yes sorry for that fucking senior moment I... <laughs> oh no no it's all right uh, well and i think that that is you know in this in this kind of big picture perspective you know one of the things that i think about that is a, a huge rhetorical help to us and ours is that you know we're dealing with we're essentially dealing with prisoners, you know, with people who have been given no reason to continue existence. And to go back to Lewis this is one of my favorite analogies from Lewis. It's, it's Pilgrim's Regress. And he's actually interesting enough talking about, because this is sort of an analogy for his, you know, reconversion to, to Christianity and sort of, you know, grappling with certain philosophical yeah, His mere topics. Christianity, which is based on a series of lectures he did on the radio, was really dope. But yeah, go ahead. So this is this is similar events, but it's 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 an it's an analogy, right? It's, it's Pilgrim's Progress retold. But he describes how you know, as he was a young man, he was sort of you know captured by Freud and made it impossible for him to move. And the way that he, he uses this analogy is actually it's beautifully done. He he uses the the framework of the original story where Christian is captured by a giant and you kind of you know twist the details. And he basically describes how he is you know this this analogy for him is is waylaid by this giant and this giant has this power, right? And wherever the giant gazes, you know, your skin becomes translucent. You know, you can see your muscles moving, your, your blood pumping. And it's so horrifying. And he's essentially rooted to the spot and imprisoned by that. And the way he breaks out of this is that, you know, the angel reason comes to free him, free him from that kind of limited prism of, 
you know, Freudianism, which is that you are a beast. You know, you are just simply the kind of, you know, material of, you know, your biological frame. You know, and from our perspective, like I said, I, I don't view this as this kind of evangelical crusade where we need to knock on doors to gather people. But at the same time, you know, we, we are kind of fighting downhill from the perspective that like, well, you know, when, when, you're, when your opposition can basically give you no reason to exist other than, you know, N plus one orgasms or something. You know, it's not much of a, that's not much of a fight, you know, compared to the reds or compared to other kind of like intellectually serious opposition we've had as the right. And I think about this because looking at Gen Z, right, taken as an aggregate group, Gen Z is gayer than any other generation in both the pejorative and literal sense. But also, like, you know, I know a whole bunch of extremely staunch, you know, right wingers who basically have sort of gazed into that kind of like at the, the total ash heap of like whatever you want to call it, like post modernity and basically realized that there's there is no meaning there. It's it's dead. No, and Gen I mean, Z is, uh, they've got a bad rap and they've got, I mean, Christ, man, like most, most of the people I'm closest to these days are, are, are of your generational coterie. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the majority is always gonna be not particularly capable of much. And yeah, I realize that the kind of probably the lows, the moral and, um, and aesthetic lows of your generation is probably pretty grimy but uh the people the kind of uh you know the kind of enlightened uh like five percent or whatever of your generation is fucking great man you know and that's i mean that's the future man like um that's why i don't trash young people i mean not just because it's a shitty thing to do and it's fucking stupid but it's also particularly misguided, man. You know, like I don't, you know, it's not, it's not a bunch of guys my age who are doing anything particularly dynamic, you know? Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I, I, uh, I, one, one needs to seek out guys their own age just to be understood sometimes. And I'm lucky, you know, I, I'm lucky I got people like Mr. C and, and like our guy Pete Canones. Um, and they're and they're fucking dope. But in like absolute numbers, man, like your generation is is making this happen, you know, and that should never be um, minimized. Certainly, Thomas, we are we are out of time. This was a great episode. I really enjoyed having this conversation with you. If, if people want to find you know more of your work, what's a good way for them to do that? I'm always on Substack and I'm I'm making the transition to more video content now. And that seemed that seems to be being met with approval which is great but i'm going to continue the pod as well as like kind of more long form stuff on the substack it's real thomas 777.substack.com you can find me on youtube it's thomas tv number seven hmas tv i'm on x formerly twitter at real capital R E A L underscore number seven H M A S seven seven seven. I'm on Instagram. You can find me on Tgram. Um just look for Thomas 777. It's Thomas Graham number seven H M A S Graham. But if you serve Thomas 777, all that shit should come up. And my website um it's kind of like the one stop location to find my content and just like random stuff. Is literally thomas777.com, but it's number seven, HOMAS777.com. And that's um, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Substack, like everything like feeds into there. And I just like drop like random shit there. So that's where you can find me. Um, and yeah. Well, thanks, Thomas. I, I appreciate it. I've been enjoying reading the the serialized version of, of the next you know section of Storm Steel on your uh on your Substack, so I, I highly you. recommend yeah. that. No, people have been it's uh that's been popping pretty good, man. Like people people are really liking it, and that's that's dope. That gives me a lot of confidence, and I'm very very thankful, man, that people actually want to like read my stuff. So yeah, and thanks for hosting me, man. This was great. Yeah, sure thing. And, and as far as my stuff, you can find me on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, anywhere you want to listen to podcasts. I will say, just as a 
sort of a housekeeping note, the audio podcast has been doing exceptionally well. I'm going to focus more and more on that. This is the first month that I hit, or January was the first month that I hit 10,000. And then the first month that I hit 20,000 downloads in a month. That's so things are going, yeah, I know, which is two big goals in, in one month. So that's going. I mean, it might not sound big to people who like are looking at it in absolute terms or for like a political pod. And frankly, it's a crowded field like that we deal in. Like that's freaking, that's, that's fucking huge, man. Well, in the terms I like to put it in, because you're hundred percent right. Like this stuff will never be, you know, the top, top of the absolute charts. But if you look at a percentage over time, like, oh, Hey, like not to talk numbers, but I think I did like 8,000 in December. And to go to eight to whatever, 21, 22,000 month over no, month, freaking, percentage wise, is it's hard to argue with. No, that's huge, man. And also like the, I mean, you've been, you've been, you've been active for a minute, but in terms of your own pod, man, like doing it basically like on the regular, you only been on it for like a year or year and a half, man. Like, and that's, that's like a drop in the bucket, man. Like people, people toil for like fucking years, man, to get, you know, like a couple thousand freaking regular regular um subscribers or viewers man well, well definitely man and and i appreciate that coming from you uh in addition to that obviously you guys can can support me directly to buy my coffee link i don't expect it but it certainly does help or head over to my Substack. i've been writing more on Substack. should have a piece coming out tomorrow it's really fun i like Substack. i think that there is something spiritually healthy about putting your thoughts out permanently where they're just sitting there, you know, where people so can is dope, man. I was hoping it bummed me out in December when I thought I was going to have to jump shit because like Stripe capital was fucking with me. I mean, the reason it's aside from the fact that like, it's not good for people to be holding your money hostage. I didn't want to have to jump shit from Substack, man. Like I like it. I like the user interface. I like yeah, it's just like, a good platform, yeah. you know? Yeah, and so man, I, I'm yeah. glad that that all got sorted out, obviously. But again, if you want to support me most directly, you can do that by heading over to my sponsor, Axios Remote Fitness and Coaching. JD is a solid guy. Uh, both literally and figuratively. Such a good way to uh, support the show. And again, Thomas, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, man. Thank you. And everyone at home, keep your head up. I can't last forever. Good night.